Thank you very much, Orisia. I'm, I'm going to start talking, sort of, please do sit down. I'm going to start talking straight away because I'm conscious that already we have uh, a timetable to catch up with and we need to race through uh, some of those um, things, even, even perhaps uh, exclude from our proceedings some of those politesses that, um, with which we normally start conferences and get down to the, the meaty stuff straight away. So uh, as Arisia has just said, I'm Simon Smith. I chair the steering committee of the Ukraine Forum here at Chatham House. Um, and a, a warm welcome to everyone in this room and to the hundreds of people joining us online uh, as well. And our first panel, from which you will see we, we still have uh, one empty seat. We hope that would be filled um, very soon and while we are in action uh, but we're going to press on uh, because our first panel really what we are doing here is to look in the round at the multiple dimensions of this colossal reconstruction and recovery task. Um, do a little bit uh, to identify from various perspectives uh, what's already in place, uh, what already points to a successful concept, and what's still missing. We want to look at what needs to be got on with now uh, and what is perhaps uh, part of a, a longer term uh, concept. Uh, and in order to do this, uh, we've got four people. We have three at the moment, but we will have four. Uh, we have four people who in different ways uh, represent uh, different perspectives all of whom uh, can talk uh, on behalf of people and institutions who in different ways play vital roles in a successful concept for reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them as they speak rather than to have a round of introductions before we go. So we're going to start straight in. Uh, Lesia Ohrisko is going to kick us off. And Lesia is the head of international cooperation at RISE Ukraine. And if I tell you uh, that uh, RISE, uh, if you don't know, those four le letters stand for reconstruction, obviously, but essential components of reconstruction, integrity, sustainability, and efficiency. So, Lesia, could you kick us off, really, with your assessment so far of the extent to which integrity, sustainability, and efficiency look as if they have an assured place in the vision for reconstruction of Ukraine? Please. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, first of all, thank you so much for, for um, organizing this amazing event. Um, you know, we, we want to jump straight into the recovery issue, which is, of course, the main topic of uh, the URC and um, of this side event as well. Um, however, as a Ukrainian citizen um, that lives in Ukraine under almost daily shelling, I cannot but start with a dimension that is, however, very much intertwined with um, the recovery and rebuilding issue, which is the security dimension. Um, I think we all have witnessed during last year um, the complete failure of Russia's attempts to deprive Ukraine its nationhood, its statehood. And what we have seen over the last couple of months um, is a shift in, in their strategy, uh, which can be, in military terms, basically put down to scorched earth strategy, which, is, which essentially means if I can't have it, no one can. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, what we are seeing, especially those who are living in Ukraine nowadays on an everyday basis. They are destroying our homes, they are destroying our cities, they are targeting our critical infrastructure, they are targeting our energy sector, they are targeting our social infrastructure, and I can go on for a long time. So essentially, we are in the midst of a war of attrition. And this is precisely the moment where the economic factor and the recovery factor kicks in, because it is essentially uh, Ukraine's, because the, the center of gravity of this war, apart from the absolutely incredible work of the Ukrainian armed forces, of Ukrainian volunteers, of the society at large, which demonstrates uh, resilience that, that has surprised the world. But the center of gravity, essentially, is the economic endurance of Ukraine alongside the 
um, scale and the durability of Western support and the generous support that we have received from, uh, from our partners so far. Uh, and it is exactly recovery with a very solid economic foundation, which includes a very strong Ukrainian military and defense sector that will essentially contribute to a lasting peace in Ukraine and will contribute to peace throughout the Euro and Euro-Atlantic zone. And that's why when we're talking about Ukraine's recovery, when we're talking about uh, continue the efforts of the international community, including financial support, humanitarian support, and all the other support, we need to understand that we're not just talking about rebuilding one country, and we're not just talking about economics, but we're talking about the European security and the European project as such. And I just wanted to highlight this as, as a Ukrainian national. Now moving to, to um, the recovery part itself. Again, as a Ukrainian citizen, I cannot but state uh, two very um, important principles uh, for, for Ukraine's society and, of course, uh, the RISE coalition, which I have the pleasure to represent here. And that is, uh, one, Ukraine's ownership of the recovery process, and uh, the second is a large societal inclusion into these processes. Let me start with um, the first one. Um, why this is so important to us Ukrainians and I, why I'm starting with this principle, because over the last year there have been many discussions and speculations and, and calls for basically outsourcing the management of Ukraine's reconstruction and rebuilding into foreign international hands. Now, don't get me wrong, we are very much uh, reliant on, on the continued international support. We are very much looking forward to coordinate and to build the success story together. However, when it comes to planning, when it comes to coordination, when it, when it comes to stakeholder management, we do believe this has to be in Ukrainian hands in the first place. And there are three reasons why we think uh, that that is the case. First, it is the sole Ukrainian responsibility and duty to make Ukraine's recovery a success. And there will be nobody with such high levels of motivation and of commitment than Ukrainians themselves to deliver the results. Uh, second, um, if we outsource this function and the um, basically management of Ukraine's reconstruction into foreign hands, we will essentially, as Ukrainians, will be missing a very important opportunity to further build our institutional capacity, which is very much linked to good governance. And this is something that is very much um, being looked at uh, when we will be entering the European Union in our accession. And third, uh, Ukraine is not new under the moon. Ukraine, with its reforms, with its uh, institutions, and with <laughs> all the informations, uh, transformations that have happened, especially over the last nine to ten years, basically the post-Maidan um, period. Uh, Ukraine has delivered absolutely terrific reforms, has, has changed so many different areas, from the health sector to the digitalization, from the um, energy sector to, um, to the whole anti-corruption uh, institutions, etc. We have come up with absolutely new uh, institutions and built them from scratch. Some of the institutions have reinvented themselves, like the National Bank, like the pr uh, public broadcaster, like the Ukrainian Institute. And I can go on and go on with cases where Ukraine has delivered absolutely terrific reforms and transformations. And all of these things, I would like to remind uh, ladies and gentlemen, have happened during a war that was ongoing in the east of Ukraine for nine years. So we do have the necessary skills, hands-on experience, in changing ourselves when we have tremendous security threats and uh, challenges uh, in, in various parts of our country. Um, and this basically leads me, this, uh, these different reforms that have been built on, as we call the golden triangle um, of partnership 
which is the government, civil society, and private sector, although I would also add another one, which is the international community that has been generously supporting Ukraine. Uh, this beautiful dance of cooperation made this happen. And that brings me to my second principle, for which I don't have time anymore, as I, know, as I see, but I will just say <laughs> that it would be absolutely a missed opportunity and a big mistake if Ukraine doesn't end the international community that is helping rebuild Ukraine is not building on those successes of this beautiful dance between the different stakeholders that can change, uh, make change happen in Ukraine. The government alone or any other stakeholder alone will not be able to deliver those results that we are looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lesia. I will definitely want to come back to you on the question of sort of inclusivity of the of the program within Ukraine. Um, moving on, but I, I noticed that I did, in my haste to get moving, uh, omit uh, some important information about how this session works. Um, I should I should uh, let you know, of course, that our discussion is on the record. Uh, it is being live streamed and a recording of it will be available on the Chatham House website after the conference. So no hiding place uh, for you in the audience or online out there. Um, and uh, we will continue uh, our discussion on the panel for probably another 30 minutes or so. Uh, but around about the 10 o'clock mark, perhaps soon thereafter, uh, we will turn to you uh, for questions. So please, if you have a question, and just raise your hand, stay in your seat, um, and uh, we will deal with the questions from the floor. I guarantee you we will not be able to deal with all the questions, so sorry in advance if we don't get to you. Uh, and that applies also to our participants online. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function to put your question in. Right, I think that's covered it all. I should also, just before I pass on, mention uh, and commend to you the three very crisp, short action documents which have been prepared here in Chatham House for the information of the URC conference as it rolls forward this week. Um, I, I commend those to you. They will not take much of your time, but I think uh, very succinctly uh, encapsulate the issues that we're talking about here. Now, I want to pass on rapidly now uh, to our second speaker, uh, Marlene Madsen who is uh, from the European Union's Directorate General for Neighbourhood and Enlargement Negotiations, uh, who has a vast amount of experience on uh, engaging with extraordinarily difficult uh, organisational tasks of various sorts, uh, including struggling with a, 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 a five-year attachment to uh, the British government, which she clearly <laughs> survived in good shape. Um, so, Marlena, I want to pass them to you now. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back in London and to be back in uh, Chatham House. I have many fun memories from here, so it starts well. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a very important conference that has been uh, organized in, in the margins of or leading up to, to the URC. Um, the European Commission has been uh, supportive uh, of Ukraine from day one. Of, of this uh, very unfortunate uh, situation of Russian aggression uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, it has been very important for us to support both in the sense of humanitarian, military support, but also in finding solutions for continued uh, support for the administrations and also for the, uh, for the, the, the budgetary support for, for the Ukrainian government. Now, since the start of the war, uh, the overall support to Ukraine uh, and, and Ukrainians from the European Union, the European member states and European IFIs have uh, today amounted around 70 billion euros. Um, this is quite a significant amount raised in short amount of time. I anyone knowing anything about the EU budgets and the rules go governing this very rigid, uh, long planning system will know that that is quite an achievement that we have managed to find the, 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 the ways and the, uh, to, to provide uh, the support to Ukraine. This also uh, reflects very much uh, the unique situation of at an international level Com I uh, really unanimity in, in wanting to support uh, Ukraine, 
You've had it from all the big uh, G7 uh, partners. You've had it from all the, the international IFIs. Now, what happened last year uh, in, in the, after uh, the, the start of the war was also that uh, we continued our engagement with, you, with the Ukrainian authorities. And in June last year, we also uh, uh, gave or granted Ukraine candidate status uh, and thereby made agreements on reforms needed that could trigger uh, an opening of accession talks if member states, of course, uh, agree to that. But we set the, the scene for, for this and we agreed with Ukraine some, some important um, reforms that were needed in order to, to facilitate this. At the same time, at the end of the year, uh, the G7 agreed that the European Union should be um, in the lead of coordinating a lot of this support at international level uh, and also the, the uh, being closely involved in, should we say, the, the trying to mapping the needs. And to do this, uh, at the beginning of the, this year, we set up uh, the, the platform, the multi-agency donor coordination platform, uh, and where we have uh, in the European Un Union the, co the, the secretariat that, that provides support to this platform. Now, this, platf this uh, platform has met uh, uh, now four times uh, and is providing a very important tool to ensure that with this, should we say, really uh, unprecedented uh, big uh, need uh, for support Ukraine. We've never uh, in history, I believe, had a situation of such direct immediate support with such a challenging big uh, 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 situation that we, we need to ensure that all the donors pull in the same directions, that we guide the Ukrainian authorities in the same direction, but also that we need, that we have full information of where are the needs and do we have them covered. So uh, in, in, the, uh, in this platform, we are also discussing or facilitating that the G7 members and the IFIs can have a full overview together with the Ukrainian uh, government of where are the needs, where the financial needs, which sectors are, are also mostly affected, and ensure that we together block those financial needs. Um, Another thing that has happened that I would like to, to, to emphasize is that since 1st of February this year, we have set up a, a, a service, a, a directorate in uh, the, the European Commission's uh, Neighborhood and Enlargement Director General. And there we have um, created a, a, a big uh, directorate of three units providing uh, support analysis and uh, also legislative proposals that can guarantee the European Union's continued support to Ukraine also going forward. So just one m final little remark. While the support so far uh, has been very much focused on the immediate needs, so for instance, running costs for the budgetary, uh, uh, for the, the government uh, uh, in Ukraine to ensure that it can continue to pay its salaries and function, but another thing is also the continued support for the reforms in, the Ukra in Ukraine and, and support to SMEs, support to small farmers, support to the energy transformation, etc. In addition to this, we're working very hard also on a medium term solution with a plan together with the Ukrainian authorities because the ownership has to be on Ukraine. Uh, that we can together find a good way and a good agreed strategy of plan going forward also for the continued uh, financial support from the European Union and technical support for the reform needs uh, that will be not just right now, but certainly also when hopefully this uh, war is very soon over. So maybe I stop there. Uh, I know you're conscious of time. Thank so. you very much, Marlena. We will also come back to you on one or two uh, issues in your, your excellent opening presentation. I'm going to move straight on now to Mark Magaletsky. Um, with special thanks to Mark for stepping in at short notice, um, but to ensure that uh, we have representation here from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, um, which uh, not for the first time uh, is shaping up to play uh, an extremely critical 
pivotal role, I think, in uh, the vision for reconstructing uh, Ukraine um, and uh, will be one of those uh, institutions uh, which I think will play um, an, an extremely uh, important part in getting together uh, particularly the financing but also in laying out the concepts um, of uh, how this uh, great project can be achieved uh, with effectiveness um, and uh, with um, due sustainability. So over to you, Mark. Thank you, Simon. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. The time. Uh, indeed, um, in, the, in the past uh, uh, few weeks and months, there have been a lot of debates about uh, the, the architecture of uh, financing for uh, Ukrainian uh, recovery, what should be the role of the private sector, public sector, international institutions, national institutions, and so on. And uh, I'm sure uh, in, in, the, in the coming days uh, we'll see very uh, lively uh, discussions uh, about that. Uh, but equally important, um, and this is where I would like to focus, is, uh, is to make sure and to build uh, the, the appropriate, what we call, implementation uh, capacity uh, on, on the Ukrainian side, both the public sector and the private sector, because one challenge is to mobilize uh, financing for the recovery, but uh, another challenge is actually convert this financing into, uh, into schools, into uh, you know, roads, uh, 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 energy facilities and so on. Um, and uh, to that extent, uh, we, we are joining forces, uh, and this is on top of uh, emergency and liquidity financing that we are providing uh, to the country uh, over the last year. We are joining the forces with other international financial institutions uh, like the World Bank uh, and European Investment Bank, uh, and together with the government of Ukraine, uh, to actually identify what are the, the gaps uh, uh, in, the, in the current system, how to enforce uh, this implementation capacity. Uh, because at the end of the day, yes, there are plenty of uh, good uh, you know, construction companies, equipment suppliers, consultants and designers around the world, but you need capable people, uh, first of all, uh, on, on, in the public sector, who would actually coordinate uh, uh, all these uh, uh, all these works uh, and have an ownership and have a sort of good hand in uh, in handling uh, all these tasks and managing these companies uh, uh, because you can outsource so much but except except for that um, and uh, yes we are lucky to have uh, well. Hopefully, Mustafa will join us still, um, but he is uh, one of our main uh, counterparts uh, on the government side in this work, together with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Kubrakov. Um, so first is to build this project uh, management capacity, which means uh, you know, training uh, uh, real people who will actually do the work in project management, in procurement, uh, uh, in uh, project development uh, uh, to make sure that all necessary procedures are implemented uh, and eventually uh, what we want to see being built is actually built. Uh, second important area is uh, actually regulation uh, and we, we, we see uh, together with the government uh, what can be streamlined, improved and uh, when uh, to make sure that the result is actually efficient uh, uh, and timely. But also when, when we are talking about build back better, uh, we actually, it, it actually means that the regulation has to allow this and a regulation has to stimulate this. And in some cases, it has to oblige uh, uh, the developer to actually build it better because otherwise, uh, um, you know, if, if we are talking about public sector and the authorities, they might be obliged by the law to actually go for least cost solution, which is not necessarily better. So it's a bit of a, uh, a difficult task here, but uh, we, we all understand that it has to be done. Uh, and the third area, um, last but not least, is, uh, is building um, uh, anti-corruption and uh, uh, integrity and transparency 
uh, framework. And again, it's not only regulation, but it's also real people and the real institutions who would actually do that. Uh, and here again, we, we are lucky to have uh, uh, counterparts like uh, uh, Mustafa uh, and Alexander Kubrakov who uh, don't need to be explained why this is important and uh, uh, we are uh, working together uh, to actually have it in place because everybody appreciates uh, that it's important for the country, it's important for people, but it's equally important for international uh, donors uh, who would uh, uh, help Ukraine in this, uh, in this tremendous uh, efforts. Um, and, uh, you know, in term, coming back to implementation capacity, it's not like, it's not that it doesn't exist, yeah? Uh, because look at Ukrainerga, for example, the operator of the national grid, uh, uh, which suffered, uh, you know, the heaviest destruction since uh, the Second World War of the energy infrastructure but they managed to, to restore it. So uh, the lights are back on. Of course, there are issues, uh, there is uh, issues with reserve and so on, but it, it is back. And that shows that uh, there are, uh, you know, there is this capacity in Ukraine, but it's very uneven. Yes, so you have very good uh, and strong uh, companies, uh, maybe at the central level, you have some very strong local authorities, but at the same time, there are gaps uh, at different levels, especially when we are talking about uh, the occupied territories where local authorities are either partially functional or, or non-existent. Yeah? Uh, and this is where there is a big role for the uh, agency of restoration to be uh, like implementation agency of the last resort uh, uh, when uh, there is nobody around. So, yeah, I think this is uh, the, the, key, the key summary from my side. And I think we are getting to 10, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, I, I want to, uh, to press on now and just return very briefly to one or two points from, uh, from our panelists. Um, these will be actually already informed by a number of questions I have online. So I'm gonna to turn to Lesia first. And you were talking uh, at the end of your opening presentation about um, ownership but you were also talking about ownership in, in the sense of not only ownership by Ukraine, but ownership by Ukrainian people. We've already got a number of questions in from participants online. Um, for example, from Natalia Shcherbinina, who says, um, uh, in your opinion, how could we improve the process of involving the human potential of the Ukrainian population for the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine? Um, and one slightly more specific question from uh, Felicity Cartwright, who wants to know uh, if you have a view on uh, embedding human rights into the procurement processes um, of uh, behind rebuilding of Ukraine. But a number of questions online already on this question of, of what it is, what do we mean when we talk about a sort of inclusive concept and what can go wrong if we fail to ensure that an inclusive concept is actually part of the rebuilding of Ukraine. Thank you. Um, so essentially when we're talking about inclusivity, we're talking about a broad uh, societal inclusion. And under civil society, let me unpack it, we mean not just NGOs, uh, or a ticking the box exercise where some of the stakeholders will hold a couple of consultations with a number of organizations. We're talking of a much wider <coughs> range of stakeholders um, that is academia, that are think tanks, of course, NGOs and civil society organizations, grassroots organizations, but also and very essentially that will, from my point of view, be one of the main backbone, the, the backbone of reconstruction. This is private sector, small and medium enterprises, businesses, etc. So all of this, under all of this, we mean civil society or the broad uh, inclusion and engagement with uh, Ukraine society at large. Now, when you talk about civil society in, uh, in many other countries, um, what usually comes to mind, the first image I would say, is, is a watchdog. Um, now, uh, what many observers don't understand is the unique uh, nature of Ukraine's civil society, that is um, that we are covering a much larger range of functions very often uh, complementing or even substituting the public functions or state functions. And in Ukraine, you can find all types of, 
of dogs. It's not just watchdogs. We are, you can find dogs, uh, lawmakers who are uh, basically drafting laws and bylaws for the executive uh, and, the, and other branches of, uh, of the authorities. You can find uh, dogs, lobbyists and advocates who are taking all of these laws and, dra and draft laws and going to the parliament and, and the executive authorities and sometimes have actually much better access than the best Ukrainian or, or international lobby firms in Ukraine. You have uh, dogs, uh, experts and, uh, and analysts who are helping uh, various parts of the government in the policy cycle, especially one of the functions that is very often outsourced is the stakeholder consultation, because this is something that is very of, often lacking in Ukraine's uh, public service or, or civil service at large. Uh, and this is very often uh, outsourced indeed to, to Ukrainian civil society organizations. You can find um, uh, dogs uh, consultants who enter the government on various parts, on the central level, on the on the subnational level, that are entering institutions and are basically providing services as consultancy, advisory, etc. You can find dogs reformists. You can uh, find dogs uh, innovators. You can find uh, dogs that are service providers. Something that is also very much unique in Ukraine that you have institutions, uh, uh, non-government institutions that are providing almost government services to people. So uh, when talking about civil society in Ukraine, you really have to understand that we're looking into a, a very broad range of fun functions. And I sometimes have the feeling that this uh, uh, annoying uh, song, Who Let the Dogs Out, is actually about Ukraine civil society. <laughs> but, uh, but dogs aside and, and jokes aside, bottom line is, um, whether we like it or not, and I will not enter into the discussion whether this is good or bad, but Ukraine's uh, civil society has indeed uh, for a very long time um, been supplementing or sometimes substituting Ukraine's uh, government institutions. And this is, by the way, something that distinguishes uh, one of the many things, of course, but distinguishes Ukraine society from, for example, the Russian one, where there is a informal pact between the authorities and the citizen where you basically trade in and, and the Kremlin provided for a certain period of time uh, prosperity and stability, <laughs> but what was traded in was basically this inclusion, the participation in policy making. Now this is something that is absolutely unthinkable in Ukraine. I don't believe that any of the decisions made, uh, very important decisions about Ukraine's reconstruction, re revival and recovery can be made without the citizen without uh, different parts of civil society having the understanding that they have been hurt, that they have been consulted, etc. And I think this is basically the answer why, uh, what can go wrong if, uh, if civil society or society at large is not included, because we, because this basically speaks to the heart of our democracy and the way how Ukraine's society works. We need to be consulted and that's why this is the only way how to proceed in terms of the inclusion. Thank you very much, Lesia. And I think at this point we will need to slightly rejig our proceedings um, because it's a great pleasure to welcome Mustafa Nayam here. Thank you so much for sparing the time. Um, I think you've come a long way from our conference, so congratulations from Gadir uh, and congratulations for looking quite so cool in this, um, <laughs> in this very sticky atmosphere we've got here in London today. Um, but it's, it's, it's immense pleasure to, to welcome you. Um, Mustafa Nayam is the head of the state agency for restoration and infrastructure development in Ukraine. I hope I've got those that, that translation of the title right. Um, but uh, Mustafa Nayam is much more than that. If you don't know about um, Mustafa's uh, I would say genuinely legendary role in the revolution of dig dignity. You can look it up. Um, but it, he is someone who has been an inspirational character uh, in many of the episodes of recent Ukrainian history. Uh, and it's a great privilege to have him with us here today. But I'd like to ask you, Mustafa, about um, uh, for a few opening thoughts on your current role. We've just had uh, a little bit of a discussion looking at the uh, both the international capacity 
capacity um, of Ukraine's supporters and friends and partners elsewhere uh, to mobilize support and finance and so on, but, but homing in also on the capacity within Ukraine um, to participate in and, and to lead this uh, reconstruction program. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think I'm asking myself who is better placed than you are to talk to us about uh, your assessment of Ukraine's capacity to deliver on this extraordinarily complicated uh, and challenging task of reconstruction. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm very sorry for being late. The thing is that we just arrived uh, from uh, other uh, trip, and uh, that, that's why I late. Uh, I do not know what from what you, you started. I just uh, I will try to very carefully to describe how, how I see it and how we see our team uh, and our government the situation with the restoration itself. First of all, um, I think. We already have done many things, and we showed many things, uh, not only on the front line, but also with the, uh, with the infrastructure and with the restoration and uh, support of the uh, delivering our goods and ammunition to the front line during last one and a half year. For this year, what and I think you know that that <coughs> any kind of locations, any kind of uh, um, uh, roads or uh, routes uh, was not stopped, and uh, so we didn't have any kind of disaster uh, starting from the first day when some city or some rural villages or uh, deoccupied territories uh, didn't have chance to deliver uh, ammunition, food or medicines. So any train, any truck, any uh, other uh, vehicles who, which uh, should deliver to uh, those territories was not stopped. The second is about energy infrastructure, and you know last year what happened in uh, starting from October, and there was some time when we lost 70% of our generation, which was stopped, or 60% uh, of uh, distribution facilities, which was shelled or damaged or somehow destroyed, but we survived, and it was done. I will be very open on that. It was done without any kind of support. I mean, it was done by Ukrainian uh, people. Uh, and I'm not talking that someone is bad and someone didn't do nothing. It's not about that. It was that the world was not uh, ready to answer these kind of challenges, the same like in war. world was not ready to answer this challenge. And Ukrainian people was ready. We didn't have this kind of experience, but we did it. We didn't stop our energy. We didn't stop our roads. We didn't stop uh, our uh, trains. Everything is works now. And what is very important is that we are now prepared for the next season much better than before. From starting from the first days, our team, especially my team of agency restoration, we uh, build up passive defense facility around our substations for trains and for railways, and also for uh, distribution and energy facility generation. I mean, and 70% uh, of damage was reduced. It's because main problem was not uh, uh, missiles, but uh, shrapnel and these drones. And uh, we achieved that, so it was done. Uh, and again, um, what is very important that we did it by our all, uh, own resources. The same thing what is going on now with water. You know the problem with the uh, Kakhov, Kakovska um, uh, hydroelectrician plant, and uh, well, three three weeks ago, yes. Yeah. Have you ever heard maybe something was done by other partners in that? I don't know. I know that it was done by our people on the ground. We are cleaning streets. We are delivering water. We are now trying. Our team already has started to build pipeline which will deliver water to uh, three regions. It will be 300 kilometer of uh, pipeline. And we started to do ourselves. And we need now pumps, water pumps, which will help us to do this pipeline. No one has them. We can't find them. If someone here know how to find these plants with these uh, pumps, please help us. And that's again about Ukrainian role. So if you, when you ask, uh, is Ukraine uh, prepared or it can lead, we are leading already. We're doing that. So I think uh, that's the, the very important. But the other problem of Ukrainians, it's, it's, it's kind of usual tradition of Ukraine. During crisis, we are very brave. We are doing everything. We are best. And we are brave, we are open, but then, but I think it's not only about Ukraine. It's a human being. When you have, when you crisis, you are much more active 
uh, and you have much more motivation. But after that uh, comes days of uh, calmness uh, when people are desperate or people are going home to do their own jobs. And I think that can be a problem. And we should be prepared for that. And it's not about uh, motivation. It's not about capacity of Ukrainian people to deliver this result. The, I think it's the problem of a whole world and all uh, infrastructure of uh, financement infrastructure, first of all. I'm talking about mm, all those IFIs which are helping now us and definitely are doing the crucial role in the helping supporting Ukraine with budget shortage and helping with to, uh, to support our uh, public servants and uh, country in general. Uh, but of course, uh, we see now that the situation in Ukraine, the challenges we have, is much faster than this, uh, than other uh, stakeholders, like Ukrainian government, uh, IFIs, international partners. The other problem is its absorption capacity. As I said before, when we were in Washington, I think some people were there also. It's about uh, capacity to work with this kind of amount of money. Uh, during our history, the highest amount of money which we uh, um, uh, was uh, capable to somehow to work with, it was uh, $6 billion uh, per year. It was kind of in 2014, 15. Uh, now we're expecting uh, uh, much more money. And of course, it will be very difficult for Ukrainian infrastructure, I mean, government, um, institutions and private institutions to deliver this result and to use money. And it's not, again, it's not about that Ukrainians are bad. And I, I would be very uh, grateful to all our partners to, to stress that again and again. But when, when we say about corruption, you're saying about uh, capacity to deliver results, show me the country which can do it. Show me the country which can do all these issues during war. During war, not after war. We were now in uh, Tokyo, we arrived from there, and we uh, talked to the head of the Agency of Restoration of Japan. Uh, it, it is 12 years after uh, catastrophe they had in 2011. And even now, still, 30,000 of people doesn't have houses. Again, it, w it is not war, and everyone was supportive. We have 10 million people who was displaced. For this moment, we have hundreds of thousands of housing which was destroyed. I mean, it's not damaged, don't demolished at all. So it is difficult, but we should be prepared, and Ukraine is ready to prepare for this issue. What we need, we need people who can uh, help us, and that's inside and outside. First of all, we need experts who can structure these projects. I think we should change our procedures, we should change our approach to financement of these kind of projects. We cannot do the same way what we have done before. I mean, in infrastructural projects and financement of different uh, pu public-private partnership uh, projects and etc. It takes years, so ages to do that. The other issue, we should have some urgent budget and urgent uh, response tools to something which happened. <coughs> when we met last time, not me, but our government with our uh, partners in Lugano, at that time, we didn't have shelled electricity stations, we didn't have water, we didn't have many other catastrophes which happened, and we still doesn't have tools to respond. How we can do it? And even now, again, I will repeat it, for energy uh, infrastructure of Ukraine, we doesn't have nothing to build up this, at least shelters. I'm not talking about buying transformers. Of course, they helped us to buy transformers, and it was very useful at that moment. But we doesn't have the urgent tools to respond. We are strate doing strategy, we are doing plans, but something is going on now, and we doesn't have these tools. So I think these kind of challenges we should, uh, we should come over. First of all, it's urgent resource uh, tool. The second is capacity of our country, and we need this uh, assistance to raise this capacity to structure these projects, lawyers, uh, engineers, and other uh, experts. And of course, we need very careful approach to Ukraine uh, as to country, not uh, again as to some part of this country, because the last point I will stress, I think it's something which we will discuss many times during this conference. It's about corruption and vested interests. We cannot punish country just because some of people of this country are, I mean, had this interest or are corrupt. 
my generation was not started this my dance in 2005 2014 to be punished again because of some firtash who was corrupt please do, don't do that help us to come over that it is not way to, you know to put some you know mark on the country <laughs> saying that it's corrupt that time i was sure that it was only in ukraine now i know it's not you know only ukraine <laughs> look around you we are in london <laughs> like this country <laughs> So, again, we should people, we should help people of Ukraine, not some persons. And people of Ukraine really need some trust. We need this confidence of our partners. We need inspiration. And we are very stressed and we are very disappointed when we are doing 100% what we can do, 200%, extra mile. But some people around, us doing something wrong and our partner says that you know we have corruption and maybe we should think about something yes we have it but we are also doing another many great issues should support that issues I think that's important thank you thank you very much Mustafa and um, thank you um, I think I think you ended there with a very important point um, to provide you with a with a small amount of reassurance. I was discussing these questions with the Foreign Affairs Committee of, of, um, over in, in our parliament a few weeks ago. Um, and I was not the only one uh, actually pointing out that, that um, the understanding of the way in which corruption is being tackled in Ukraine has been tackled in the last, uh, in the last 10 or so years and so on. Um, it, it, it is a moving picture. Um, and I think I was not the only one, as I say, I think you can be reassured that many of the witnesses talking to the Foreign Affairs Committee at that stage were saying that, that you know, precisely warning against the sort of um, response that, uh, that you've talked about. So I think understanding of that is, is certainly growing. Um, I'd like to just very quickly pick up on a couple of other really important things that you mentioned there. Um, you mentioned, obviously, that uh, there are things that are there are things that, as you put it, take ages. There are things that are urgent. And uh, I think that, that a lot of us are very rapidly learning that uh, recovery of Ukraine is not about waiting for the war to end. It cannot be waiting for the war to end. But that requires that there is almost a sort of split focus on what is urgent um, at the same time as building with Ukraine um, a longer-term vision of recovery that will actually work. So I wonder if I could very, very briefly bring in our two representatives from, in a sense, the sort of multi, multinational agencies, as it were, just to ask you, first of all, Marlena, from the EU perspective, um, what specifically, for example, in the EU accession process is there that can actually work with Ukraine right now for the things that um, that can be uh, that that can be made uh, better that can be made more receptive uh, that can build capacity to do things to, to rebuild right now and then I'd just like to ask Mark more or less uh, a similar question um, in the sense of the EBRD um, how are you geared up to be not only looking ahead a number of years and elaborating great concepts for how things can be done in the future, but how are you geared up uh, to be pitching in now on the urgent needs uh, which arise from the, the appalling destruction that has been visited on Ukraine already? Marlena. No, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for a very good uh, uh, presentation also from uh, Mustafa. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, in EU uh, made available these 70 billion euros for Ukraine. But it's not just about the money and it's not just about uh, the investments. It, what is very important for the EU in the support for Ukraine going forward and, and at the moment right now, right here, because I agree very much on this time dimension, uh, is to help and support also with increasing the capacity of the public administration and increasing the capacity to exactly handle uh, all these investment needs, all these reform needs, and at the same time also doing whatever we can to support also the reforms needed. Now, I also mentioned earlier on that we had in June last year given Ukraine uh, candidate status uh, for the EU. 
And this is not just, uh, this really reflects many years of reforms going on in Ukraine. Lesia also mentioned it in her presentation. Efforts have been going on for many, many years. And there has been a, a, a very impressive progress on, on alignment with many, in uh, many areas of EU uh, legislative uh, framework. Now this, therefore, we granted it uh, the candidate status, and this gives the, the relation an even more, should we say, uh, close cooperation in the sense that it, it starts a, a quite a set procedure for regular engagements on uh, ensuring alignment with the EU, but it's also opening up access to EU markets and EU programs. Uh, we have, uh, just as a very concrete uh, example, uh, we have been discussing with the Ukrainian government and there were 15 uh, EU programs they wanted to have access to. Now they have access to 12 of them. We're working intensively to get the last. But this is just small steps. I think by far the most important part of the candidate status <coughs> is this reform agenda and alignment with the EU uh, regulations. And there we have had several regular meetings with various parts of the authorities um, and that will continue very much going forward in this uh, continued support over the next uh, years. We will intensify, we will be in Ukraine regularly because this cannot be done from Brussels alone. So we'll be traveling a lot, be sure we are present there and that we have close engagement and can support uh, the best possible way in, in, in aligning with this. This is not just in should we say things like regulatory standards that can facilitate access to EU markets and improve the, 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 the possibilities to trade with you, but it's also in issues that are directly uh, just as important for the rebuilding of Ukraine. So for instance, in the whole environmental sector and area to exactly also this horrible story with the dam, where uh, at least from the more reform and regulatory perspective we can we can certainly help and we can provide technical assistance and experts uh, to help in the process we're working very closely with the core group that has been set up to assess the environmental uh, damages there of course that's not doesn't mean that we on day one have the pipelines uh, for for the providing clean water but we're doing what we can in the context of of the, the EU setup uh, and will certainly scale up further. I think in a couple of hours you will probably see how we will scale up even further in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Very briefly, Mark, um, I'd, I'd like to hear your assessment of the EBRD and, if, if, if you can, other IFIs of, of this sort of rapid response capacity because, you know, we've heard from, from Mustafa about, about a lot of stuff that is there are really urgent needs. How well set up are um, the, the multilateral finance institutions um, to be not just looking ahead, but to be capable of, of rapid response? Yes, absolutely, uh, because uh, the needs are there already, and uh, it's not like the country can wait uh, one bright uh, day uh, after the victory to start doing something. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we are happy uh, to, to join uh, forces with our key counterparts uh, in the country, both in the public and, and private sector. Um, and uh, by, the, by the time of the war, uh, the key, uh, uh, m many important uh, uh, infrastructure providers in the country uh, were our existing client, like uh, Ukrenerga, Ukrhydroenerga, uh, Ukrzaliznitsya, uh, the agency, the former Ukra after door, uh, and in the number of key municipalities. So, uh, from our side, uh, the first step was uh, to to work closely with those companies to see what what do they need uh, here and now. Uh, somebody need liquidity. Somebody need uh, capex for urgent recovery, and of course, uh, we understand the, the extraordinary times. And uh, from our side, uh, for example, things that. In, in normal times would take uh, uh, two or three years, uh, were done in two or three months. Uh, the, the, the latest example is uh, Ukrenerga, financing for Ukrenerga emergency restoration. So uh, we managed to find you know, quick solutions uh, in terms of uh, preparations and putting financing in place. So the bigger challenge, and, and Mustafa mentioned, for example, if you need 
large uh, scale pumps, where do you find them? They, they, they are not on the shelf. The same was Ukrenerga auto transformers, uh, you know, high voltage. Uh, they had to be made in order, yeah, and uh, it took us, uh, you know, three months to put financing in place, but it takes uh, eight to ten months for the manufacturer to actually produce them and deliver. But it is what it is. So uh, I think uh, uh, in, in each of our role, us as a bank, uh, uh, government agencies, you know, we need to do at least our part as uh, quickly as, as uh, and as efficiently as, as possible. And Mustafa, I also mentioned in, in my introduction that uh, uh, we are uh, working together on building this institutional capacity on the public side, including uh, with your agency. So what is needed, uh, you know, we, we will find the solution. So that's uh, the way. And, and by the way, would like to thank uh, a lot to our uh, international uh, partners, the governments, uh, our shareholders, including United Kingdom and uh, European Union, United States, uh, for actually uh, helping, uh, you know, supporting our financing with, uh, with partial guarantees and with grant financing, which uh, made it possible for us to continue, despite the war, to continue uh, financing and not, not stopping for, for a single day since last year. Thank you very much, Mark. I'd like to race on now and uh, throw the discussion open to questioners. Loads of hands going up. I've had one or two already. Um, if you are selected to ask a question, please identify yourself and please, please keep your question short. Um, we'll go to the gentleman here first. And the short on the Stockholm Free World. And the Oslo Stockholm Free World Forum. My question is primarily to Marlene. You mentioned what I think is the most important to, uh, now to get uh, the platform working. You mentioned that four meetings have been held, but uh, the Rammstein uh, Forum for uh, Military Help uh, has met more than uh, uh, a dozen times and once a month, why no, not adopt that rather than limit it to the uh, G7? And uh, shouldn't it be properly formalized? Now you call it rightly a platform. Shouldn't it be a Ukraine agency? And the nearest we have for a Ukraine recovery agency is uh, your uh, a service that you mentioned now that the EU so laudably has established. And I would also be interested in hearing Mustafa's comments on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take one more question over here in the front row, please. You, madam. Yep. Thank you. Louise Kwai, Kimonix. My question is really for Mustafa. There's a huge opportunity here in building back. But I also wondered if there is an opportunity to promote and enable diversity in leadership and female diversity in the leadership within Ukrainian government mechanisms. Thanks very much. Okay, first question for Marlena on the sort of EU institutionalism. Well, uh, EU institutionalism, that sounds really, um, maybe not <laughs> like, really uh, exciting, it, it? it doesn't sound <laughs> like scary. a speedboat in action, no? Uh, G7, well, it's not like, it, it's not like you can call the highest level and set up a meeting with two days notice. Uh, we could do that at the beginning of the war. <laughs> Uh, but at this point in time, uh, and to prepare the steering committee meetings uh, thoroughly and have the notes ready that needs to be discussed, we also need to have a bit of time to prepare. Now, what I, what I mentioned in my beginning of my presentation is that this, was, this mandate was given in January, no? So since January until now, there's been four meetings. I don't think it's that bad, no. Uh, when we are talking about this is the really highest level uh, meeting. Also, what we have been preparing in between, there's been several meetings. It's not like nothing is happening in between the big bosses talking. Uh, so there's been a lot of preparation ongoing to ensure the coordination, as I said, and, and the information gathering. Where are the financial needs? Where are the most immediate with the sectors that need for us? Because this is all about sequencing. With this such a daunting task we have here, we need to sequence it so cleverly to get to optimize all the, the both the reforms and the investment that we're going on with now. So we need to have the information, we need to have the evidence so that they can make the right decisions in between. So, but the idea is indeed that the meetings will take place once a month, more frequently when needed, 
but let's see if once a month could not be uh, indeed uh, uh, a very good way going forward. Um, on the on the what role should it have? Should it be more like a Ramstein and should it be more like an agency? I think there is a bit of confusion of what the, what the platform is. Now it's a coordination uh, about the funding needs and ensuring that the, those gaps are fixed. That is the main purpose, and then of course that the investment goes to the right areas. So uh, it's it's about ensuring the financing, the ownership has to be on Ukraine as well. And Ukraine has established agencies for, for so these, these areas. So I think at the international level, we need to ensure we have covered the, 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 that we have the awareness and, and the input from the Ukrainian administrations on where the needs are, and we ensure that we can block them. And, and that is, in very simple terms, the main role of the platform. We will, of course, also look into ensuring no competition on projects from the different uh, international donors, etc., going forward. But it's just, let's not confuse it with the ownership is on Ukraine. No? And it has to be if we want to do this well. So. Thanks, Oleda. Uh, Mustafa, female leadership in recovery of U Ukraine. <laughs> I think we don't have problem with that. I mean, if you have some problem with that, to show me. <laughs> our, in our agency, and I, I, our two deputies of our three deputies of our minister are women. Uh, there are five of them in, in general, or six, and three of half of them are women. My one deputy is woman, and uh, many other members of team. We are not. I mean, within the cabinet, within the, cabinet, the first uh, vice prime minister is woman, as I remember. Uh, <laughs> maybe something changed for this <laughs> week. Uh, the, the two other ministers also. So I mean, uh, for, it's not comfortable question for me because I understand it's not problem with us. If someone feels that, I would say in Ukraine, uh, women is much, much much more active and effective than men in many senses. That's true. I mean, just it's not. I'm not kidding. And just not because you asked me. Yeah, and it's true, but we doesn't have any kind of restrictions on that. Thanks. Let, let's have the next question. Um, gentleman at the back there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Daniel Bilak, uh, Kinsteller Law Firm. Uh, just, to, just to that last point, there are more women serving in combat roles in the Ukrainian Armed Forces than in the American Armed Forces. Uh, the 40,000 altogether. Uh, my question to uh, Mustafa, uh, the, uh, one of the most successful reforms that Ukraine has ever undertaken was decentralization with the amalgamated communities turning them into uh, um, this is All of the discussion, most of the discussion today has been at, at the very uh, central level. Unless we engage the regions and the Hromade in the recovery, there will be no recovery. And uh, I just wanted to know what, what your agency is doing in order to get that voice and get, that, get those projects. It has to be done from the bottom up, not top down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more question. All right. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, Victoria Grip, uh, the member of Ukrainian parliament, uh, member of energy committee, and the head of the energy security subcommittee. Uh, thank you very much again for uh, this excellent presentation. Uh, the only thing what I want to focus on uh, that uh, definitely we do have big problem with energy infrastructure and unfortunately we cannot wait. Uh, the coming winter will be even more difficult than the previous one because we don't have reserves now. Uh, and uh, if we won't move uh, really quickly, uh, we'll stuck. Uh, I suggest uh, Mustafa you to work with uh, my subcommittee as well, because we do have instruments, uh, we do have understanding uh, what we need to do. We definitely need more assistance now, short-term assistance, because we must divide long-term strategy and uh, short-term strategy as well, uh, because we need to survive. And believe me, it will be critical. Thank you. Okay, Mr. I think those are both yours, I'm afraid. Decentralization and the energy I'll, infrastructure. I'll start from last one and then to go to, to more, uh, more difficult question. Uh, the thing is that about uh, cooperation, 
We are in very close cooperation with uh, Mr. Galushenko, with uh, my colleague Mr. Kudritsky, who is great and did their job. And we are actually doing this construction, you know, I think you know about our projects, about the construction and shelters. But of course, we will be very open. And you're right that it will be very difficult to, for us to survive this uh, heating season, but I'm sure that we will be much more prepared, much more prepared, because unfortunately for last shellings, I mean, last first shellings uh, last year, uh, we were not prepared at all. I mean. I don't know why, but it, it, it is true. So this moment, uh, I can say that um, kind of 80% of our substations distribution are protected from shrapnels and drones. Uh, it 80%. It's just for six months. I hope that we will be also able to build up uh, more effective uh, constructions and solutions for uh, um, protecting for uh, light missiles. Uh, I hope so, because it takes time and we doesn't have enough beton in our country. Uh, and, uh, and that's also a problem. But for next season, uh, heating season, we will be also able to, um, to protect main grid only uh, also from uh, heavy uh, missiles. That's our biggest priority, our first priority, I would, I would say. Though. Every day we are talking with that. And I will be happy to come to the committee to explain what we are doing. Please, that will be great. About decentralization. You know, that's, that's for me, it's very, um, very sensitive and very warm question. I will say, um, describe why, because uh, first of all, let's start with that, about tensions between uh, central level uh, government agencies and uh, local authorities. Rise hand those in whose countries you don't have this problem. Maybe there are someone. Maybe in some countries we have all, everyone is consensus. No. The other issues, rise hand who always agree with what is doing your government agency, I mean central agencies, and you agreed with that, and the local level. So it is something natural. But there are other problems, I don't want to hide this problem, is that we always, of course, in this competition, central government agencies has much more capacity to win, which is not good. What we are doing and what is our approach? First of all, uh, our agency working not on the central level, we have 2,000 people who work in each and every community. There are uh, services and offices in each oblast. And these people are not from Kiev, they're not from capital. They're living in these countries, in, in these counties, and they're living in these districts. We are gathering inquiries from these territories about damaged facilities, and it is not our will to define what should be restored. It's not our will of the agency, it's not will of the ministry. But from the other side, those who are even at least one year was involved in Ukrainian infrastructure problem, medicine, healthcare or education, you know that infrastructure of Ukraine is overloaded by all these facilities. We don't need so many schools. We don't need so many universities. We don't need so many hospitals which was built up during Soviet Union. But now, when they were damaged and destroyed, all communities want to, to, to rebuild everything, which is absurd. And of course, when you try to explain them that, look, we don't need two small schools which was damaged in two uh, regions. We need one which can bring more resources, which can be more effective, which can be more useful, and buy six buses, which can bring all these schools. And of course, we should explain to some ex constituency or some district that, you know, the school will not be in your uh, uh, region, but in, in the uh, region near you. And of course, these conflicts, these tensions, but again, we cannot dictate them. If they have resources, they can do build what they want. From the other side, we have national strategy of, for example, for uh, school grids or a, a national grid of uh, hospitals and clinics. And we understand that rebuilding these territories, we should be in line with some strategy, not because of only wish of some small uh, um, constituency or, or, or big constituency, it doesn't matter. And the other problem is that people on the ground, they're living together with those people who are living near them, and there are always tensions between politics and public servants. When you're politics, you should be liked, always. 
that's the nature of the politics. When you're public servants, you don't have to be liked. You should do, you know, it, it should be just effective. And this conflict between effectiveness and attractiveness, this is the main problem of uh, decentralization of Ukraine. And from my perspective, and for me it's very uh, uh, um, sensitive, why I said before, because we are from one side our central level government agency, and we should do priority of the government. From the other side, we are living with the communities. We are building for them. We are building for those who will live there. And some, when, when the head of office, for example, in Kharkiv Oblast uh, came to me in my office and said that, look, we need this school because I'm living there, there my friends are studying there. And I understand that he will not do something bad because it is his city. So I can't say that we have problem with decentralization. What we have problem with is about responsibility of those who are on the ground to understand what they're doing. I will show you and I try to explain one example. When we first time ask our regions, all regions, uh, please uh, send us inquiries which kind of facilities in education should be restored. And we opened this list. You know, when you see this data, I thought that we have war not on the east side, but on the west side. <laughs> Zakarpatia sent me more 10 times more inquiries than Kherson Oblast. And you know, of course, when I said that, you know, sorry, I can't do that, they can say that I'm not about decentralization, that I'm not trying to interfere something. From the other side, I understand that Lviv Oblast, much more capable to deliver result. They have much more resources and people to talk to you to explain their problems. In Kherson, we doesn't have administration. There are just five people who are working on the ground. Five. Not 500, five people. And this territory, of course, they are not now well communicated. They can't say everything they want to do, and they cannot structure all these projects. And that's why government exists, and that is what we can do. And of course, in Kherson, me, my agents, and our team, we will do much more. And we will spend more time, more money, more efforts to do there, but not in Lviv Oblast. It doesn't mean that I don't like Lviv. <laughs> But the thing is the difference. So I think this, this responsibility and try to estimate real needs of country during war and after war, that is the main problem we will have, but not decentralization. Again, I don't think that we have no problem with that. Okay, let's take another couple of questions. Lady in the fourth row there, yes. Thank you. Um, Titana Filevska, Ukrainian Institute. Um, we are all saying that this is a genocidal war against Ukrainian identity and that Russia targets cultural uh, objects that Ukraine destroying museums and burning books. Um, I would like to ask, let's say you first of all, how do you see the role of culture in the reconstruction of Ukraine? Because unfortunately, it's not on the agenda of the conference it, at all. And thank you, Mustafa, for raising the question of education because it's also not on the agenda. But uh, if we are um, pre uh, pre preserving our identity and not talking about education or culture in reconstruction, how do we restore Ukraine? Thank you. Let's have one more. Uh, let's go right to, right to the back. You, sir, uh, right at the back now. William Morrison, Metrics Led. Is the, the, the need for Ukrainian leadership of reconstruction is well understood. What about the international community? There's a lot of talk of platforms, but platforms don't lead. Who should lead the international community? Let's take those two questions. Let's say one for you, uh, for starters, but maybe most of our on uh, culture, education, um, and then maybe I'll turn to our multilateralists for the um, the, uh, the second question. Who do, do, do you feel unled? <laughs> Let's hear first for this very important question and it is indeed a shame um, that culture and uh, less so education but first and foremost culture has not been very much prominently featured in in uh, this conference although I think you are talking to the heart of of our problems that caused basically uh, the full-scale war because we are essentially uh, talking about not just a country that wants more territory or something. We're talking about a, 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 a 
basically core of imperialism that do doesn't want the existence of another nation. And what a nation is uh, uh, featured in is, is basically its, its culture, its identity, its language, etc. Uh, now, the argument that, that Mustafa has rightly mentioned when he was talking about decentralization and about uh, um, not having necessarily the, the means to rebuild every single school or every single hospital is very much uh, true. And I, and I do agree that this applies to these sectors of, uh, of Ukraine's rebuilding and reconstruction. Now, unfortunately, this argument does not work for cultural institutions because every cultural institution um, has a different message to deliver and has a, a special cultural role and a special identity that it carries for the citizens and for, for people who are visiting um, Ukraine or we hope that will be visiting Ukraine after the full-scale war. So, of course, culture has a very uh, uh, unique place in terms of uh, reconstruction of Ukraine. However, what is uh, important now is that we, uh, in, co in coordination with our international uh, partners, can further build on the public administration reform and improve the good governance. Because one of the central problems currently, and that has been also very much uh, visible in the response, that the response of the Ministry of Culture or uh, the smaller constituencies, the smaller uh, regions that uh, had basically no capacity in, in terms of uh, quick, quickly responding to the needs. I'm talking about museums that had no capacity to uh, to hide their their properties. I'm uh, talking about more international outreach in order to to get international support and um, and deliver the message that uh, culture has to be preserved during wartime. Um, so I, th I think sure. I, I, if I can stop you there, I think we, we still have a one un unanswered question. So I want to hear from very briefly from Marlene and Mark. What about leadership in this international effort? And then I'm going to ask Mustafa for your view on the leadership uh, question. Marlene, well, very quickly. Well, uh, I, I, there aren't, first of all, there aren't a lot of platforms, at least not to my knowledge. The, we were talking about one platform, and that's the multi-agency donor coordination platform, mm -hmm. and it was not me coming up with a name. Uh, and uh, that platform, as I mentioned, is a G7-led platform. Uh, the European Commission has been asked to coordinate and steer it in the context, uh, because of the context of the enlargement process, no? So I don't know if the G7 countries do not feel governed or led. I think they do. I think they are very uh, satisfied. Of course, you can always say, did it hap happen fast enough? But anyone uh, knowing anything about recruiting at uh, international level quickly for secretariat will also know it takes time. Mm -hmm. There are procedures. We cannot just, when you're in war, you can have uh, certain procedures that can go faster uh, in the European Commission, we cannot breach these. Uh, so we have to, to follow and apply by the rules. But uh, certainly, this platform is meeting regularly. The Secretariat is now up fully <coughs> functioning. We're working very closely with the Ukrainian uh, uh, authorities on this. Thank you. Well I just I want to say one more thing. I'm sorry, I will not. Uh, Make it quick. <laughs> very quick, I'm always quick. On, on the thing about the, uh, um, the, the, the rebuilding, and I, I, I wanted to pick up on the culture thing, even if maybe you think it's not me, but actually in the European Commission, what we have been uh, focusing very much on is that it has to be a holistic. We cannot just think in traditional terms about there is the infrastructure needs at the moment and they're massive, but you need to have a resilient, strong society and economy that functions. That is our goal. And, and it, our goal is that it's part of the European family. Now, for that to be in place, you also need to have a place where the whole society can function, and that's culture as well. But of course, there is a prioritization and a sequencing, no? We have to also be a bit realistic and pragmatic. But I think it's absolutely essential that those areas are covered as well. That's also why, for instance, I'm spending personally an enormous amount of my time also on, on social policies. And, and supporting children, supporting rehabilitation. 
So we have to, to look at it as a whole and not just the immediate uh, big uh, uh, traditional areas. Thank you very much. Mark, very briefly, uh, do you feel that that's a deficit of leadership from where you were sitting? <laughs> Certainly not at this stage. But I think uh, the whole issue of uh, architecture for Ukraine support is still, is still an open one, whether there will be one big fund or one big platform which will be responsible for everything is still uh, to be debated. And uh, I think there will be a lot of discussions uh, during the conference about this. So let's, let's watch closely. I don't think there is an answer to that question yet. OK, very last word, Mustafa. I'm going to ask you the same question. I mean, look, looking outwards from, uh, from, from Ukraine, I think you've, you've made absolutely the right point to say how much, um, in a sense, is being led here by Ukraine. Um, and, uh, but but uh, you have, in support of Ukraine, uh, a lot of structures, a lot of institutions, a lot of people piling in there. But do you think it needs more coordination, more leadership? It, should it be better? I think we, we always we need more coordination leadership in all problems we have. It's not only about Ukraine, not only about war, unfortunately. But I, I would say that as, as a conclusion, as a, as a last word, first of all, I'm very thankful to all of you and all those who are helping Ukraine. And it is not about money. Sometimes it's just about phone call. Sometimes it's just about some statement. Sometimes it's just when you see that someone feels the same emotions you feel. And sometimes it's just when someone is disturbed outside of Ukraine, never been in Ukraine. And of course, without all these emotions and support, we would never come over this problem. We would never win. That's also true. So when we are asking for something more faster or more leadership, it's not because we think you are not doing enough. We are just in the heart of this fire. And now our, our people at this moment are dying. And it's not only about, you know, that, that we need money or support from you or, but we just one thing we ask for is just to feel the same emotions and to understand that sometime, sometime, you should come over your procedures. Sometime you should do something maybe even not the way you did before to save those who are now in the situation they never used to be. We never used to fight against this kind of army. The first days of our war, we just was happy about javelins. Now we have patriots. No one could expect at that moment. And if you ask someone that moment, give us patriots, someone would say about procedures, rules, about exp expectations, about corruption or something. But now it is obvious and open that if you would have these patriots one year ago, maybe we'd avoid much more death in our country. I'm not blaming anyone. I understand that it's a natural way of history. But this is also some lessons we should learn, something we can do faster to save more lives. So I'm again, but on the other side, I can't even imagine what can happen if all of you would not support us. That would be, I mean, that were catastrophe. So I'm very, thank you to all of you. And I'm invite you to, to Ukraine, really. I think when you come to Kyiv to talk to those people, to see in your eyes what is going on there, you will be much more, you know, coordinated <laughs> with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, those uh, splendid remarks to end our session. Uh, and I'm afraid that is the end. My apologies to lots of people who I know had questions um, and who could have uh, continued um, a, a great discussion for at least another hour, if not more. Uh, apologies to those online as well if we didn't get to, to your questions. Uh, I, am, I do feel under a little bit of pressure to keep the timetable from uh, slurring uh, way off track. So that's so we'll end it, but just with a, a big thanks to all our participants. Thank you very much for being such an interesting